Okay, so in this unit, we started out with looking at cell structures, all the little pieces and parts and components that make up the cell. Big question you need to be able to answer. What is the energy producing structure within cells? There's actually a couple different varieties. Which structure makes energy for the lion you're looking at here that's eating the remains of the giraffe, which cellular structure is the powerhouse for that animal, what cellular structure was the powerhouse for the giraffe, but also notice it's they're both laying in grass. What cellular structure is the powerhouse for the grass? Now keep in mind most producers have two or three different varieties of powerhouses, whereas animals have only one powerhouse. So when we look at energy, energy is the ability to do work. Metabolism is how efficient a cell is, or we could say how efficient an organism is, at doing that work. How good is your cell at taking available sources of energy converting them into a usable source. So these are things we're going to be taking a look at as we go through this chapter on energy and metabolism. So this is the foundation for ecosystems and food chains. So we're covering energy and metabolism here in this course this semester. As you guys move on into the bio majors course, um, bio 112, and you cover ecology and look at food chains and how energy flows through ecosystems, it all comes back to this idea or the concepts that we're going to talk about here. Okay, so when we look at energy, energy typically comes in two different forms. So living systems simply convert it from one form to another. Now the two forms of energy we generally see when we work with systems are potential and then kinetic. So the example here with the young girl at the top of the slide, potential energy is energy that is stored or available and ready to do something. That energy gets converted and as it's converted it turns into kinetic energy, energy of activation. So as she's zooming down that slide, that is kinetic energy, energy of motion. So put it into a food chain perspective. Potential energy is energy that is stored in the body. We could call it glycogen. We could call it starch. It's the adipose tissue within an animal cell. It is a stored form of energy. That energy is then broken down and converted into energy of motion or what we call the kinetic energy, energy of activity or activation. When we eat food, anything we're eating is a form of potential energy. So the piece of pizza you have right now, the glass of wine, the bottle of Pepsi, all those things are potential energy. And our body takes it and converts it into energy of motion or kinetic energy. Now what we'll, we'll visit the concept throughout this chapter, you use what your body needs. The rest of that energy, if the body doesn't need it, it tends to store it and it says hey let's hang on to this let's pack this into storage form and this is when we get into the concerns of weight gain so we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this particular chapter as well okay so reactions that involve energy oxidation reduction these terms are coming back to us so when we have something that loses an electron electrons removed from it, we say it has been oxidized. So as a substance, and in this diagram here, the example is A, substance A. A lost an electron, became oxidized, which gives it that little positive charge there on the right-hand side. It's a lower energy unit with that very slight positive charge. The B substance has been reduced which means it's gained the electron. It's actually picked it up, probably took it from A. Maybe it's forming a particular type of bond. The B substance, since it has been reduced, actually has a higher level of energy, and that's going to give it that very small, slight negative charge associated with it. Okay, so 
reactions in the body are constantly associated with converting energy and moving energy from one source to another and changing its form and shifting it around if the body needs it. Again, if we bring in, and let's just use easy numbers here, we bring in 3,000 calories of potential energy based upon the food we've eaten, yet our body is only converting and using 2,000 calories, that means you got an extra 1,000 calories that your body is not going to convert, that gets stored. Again, we'll get into that a little bit more with metabolism. Now, the conversion of energy follows two laws. These laws are the laws of thermodynamics. So make sure you guys are comfortable and remember the laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us energy cannot be created or destroyed. So the forest fire we're looking at here, burning those leaves, you're not destroying energy. You're not creating energy. You're simply changing it. So first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is only altered in form. So the leaves, that's potential energy. That energy is converted into heat. The fire, the burning of those leaves is a conversion of their stored energy into the energy of heat. Heat being given off when the leaves are being burned. So all systems follow first law of thermodynamics when energy is involved. Now, the second law of thermodynamics is based off of the first law. The second law of thermodynamics, what we're seeing down here with the triathlete on the bicycle, the second law tells us during energy conversion, no system is 100% efficient. Nothing. We know of nothing on the planet that when the energy is converted, it is 100% efficient. So all of the energy that's trying to be converted, a lot of it does not convert into the energy of motion or kinetic energy. Instead, a big, big percentage of it is actually turned into heat. So the athlete, they ate breakfast. They probably were consuming food while they were on their bike. That food that's in their stomach and they're digested into their bloodstream and all that energy is getting converted into energy of motion, but a bunch of it is also being converted into heat. And this is why the body temperature of the athlete is going up and then their body responds by sweating in an effort to cool the system. So we can think about the properties of water we discussed earlier in the semester. Water can absorb large amounts of heat so as the body temperature increases because of the second law of thermodynamics, we start to sweat in response to that conversion of energy and the production of a lot of heat. Okay, so every system, when we talk about conversion of energy, follows these laws of thermodynamics. You guys want to make a lot of money, figure out how to defy the laws of thermodynamics when we create equipment. Think about cars. Your car takes gasoline, converts it into energy of motion, but it also gives off a lot of heat. That's why you need a cooling system and a radiator. Can we figure out how to defy that law of thermodynamics and make cars more fuel efficient, converting the energy at a higher efficiency rate? So, great opportunity if somebody's interested, the challenge is how do you defy or manipulate the laws of thermodynamics? So it'd be interesting to see if somebody in the future figures that out. Okay, so as we're looking at the conversion of energy, this thing called entropy is happening. Now, entropy is a measure of disorder, disorganization, call it chaos, whatever you want to call it. It's a measure of disorder. Now, systems tend to go towards a, a, a level of disorder spontaneously. So the picture here, you know, here's your bedroom, nice and neat and organized on 
Monday morning by Wednesday or Thursday, chaos. The room's a complete mess. It's in shambles. It seems like it just happens without even trying that. Poof. Wow. It's a big mess. That's disorder. That is the direction the universal entropy or the universal energy is moving towards. Overall, entropy or disorder in the universe is increasing. The reason for that, to go back the other direction towards organization, requires the input of energy. So it's a lot harder to become organized than it is to become disorganized or disordered. So living systems go against entropy. They actually become organized as we grow and we develop, but that requires an input of energy. Now, in the earth or on a living system, you can go against entropy, but eventually that living organism will die, they will break down, they will decompose, and they will move towards a measure of disorder, releasing energy. So again, universally, entropy is increasing within living organisms. We can go against it for a short well, temporary period of time or for the lifetime of the organism, but ultimately everything's moving towards entropy. So something to think about as we look at different systems and different pathways. So, okay, so the two types of reactions that we're going to explore, and we'll see this as we get into different pathways, the two types of reactions are what we call endergonic and exergonic. Ender refers to input. Energy has to go into it in order for it to occur. In order for that pathway or that reaction to happen, energy is, you need to put energy in. So look at the little bean seeds germinating. That takes a lot of energy to get a bean seed to grow. It takes energy from within the bean seed. The stored energy is getting converted and that is allowing or fueling the growth of the bean plant. Now the exact opposite, exergonic, exiting or releasing energy, that's a whole lot easier. So the apple on the right there that over time is decomposing and rotting and falling apart, that's easy. That releases energy and gives off energy. Nature likes those. Nature likes exergonic reactions. So the other parallel to think about with these two reactions, endergonic is growing and building and assembling things. Exergonic is breaking down, decomposing, and destroying these things. So again, ecosystems function off of this. Living organisms function off of this. We need to bring energy in to grow. Ultimately, we are going to break down and decompose and become like that apple we will go through exergonic reactions at some point in our lives. Okay, so as we're doing this, as we're going through these reactions, catalysts are required. Now, catalysts are substances that will increase the rate of a reaction. So the little kickstart on the side is kind of like a catalyst. It gets you going in the morning. It gives you energy and it fuels and says, okay, I'm ready to get going because it kickstarts you. That's what catalysts do. Catalysts just make it easier for a reaction to happen. Now, for a reaction to occur, it requires an input of energy. It's like paying your dues. And that input of energy is called activation energy. So if you look at the blue line, there's a big hill of energy required to get this reaction to occur, to have the reactant eventually become the product. But when a catalyst is present, that hill of energy is significantly smaller. Okay, so simple example, it's like starting a business. You need $10,000 to start the business. That's your activation energy or your startup capital. If you have a catalyst present, this is like your best friend or your uncle or your parents or whoever's going to help you with the business, they reduce the amount of money you need to put in. So they bring it down to Okay, you only need $1,000 to get this business started. You reduce the activation energy when a catalyst is present. Again, they speed up 
reactions by lowering the requirement of energy needed. So we'll talk about catalysts in a little bit here.